Gree Podcast, authentic chat about medicines, pharmacy and healthcare in the UK. Pharmacists Jamie, Gimmo and STC take on topical and controversial stories, but keep it edgy yet lighthearted. Podcasts share their desert island drugs and joyful patient stories. Welcome to the Oral Pod 3 Podcast. My name is Jamie Hayes. For this episode, we're joined by Professor Delith James. Delith is a Professor of Health Psychology and Pharmacy Practice in the School of Sport and Health Sciences at Cardiff Metropolitan University. We will welcome Delith in a moment. Now, this is usually the point where I say, as she shares her Desert Island Drug, her career anthem, and recommends a book for the Oral Apothecary Library. But listener, I have news. STC has broken the podcast. All will be revealed in a moment, and so perhaps for one last time, I get to say, as she shares her Desert Island Drug, her career anthem, and recommends a book for the Oral Apothecary Library. For our micro-discussion... We look at the effectiveness of interventions to improve medication adherence. Or with the jargon monoxide meter turned right down, why don't patients take their tablets and what can they do about it? But first, let me welcome my two fellow apothecaries. STC is in Bournemouth and Claire is in Newbury. Welcome both. Good evening and welcome Claire. Thank you very much. Honoured to be here. Well, as the very first guest, we did say to you that if we ever had a situation where we needed a third apothecary or a first sub, you would be first on the list. I'm absolutely thrilled to bits. I got a phone call earlier this evening and I was delighted to step in. Uh, I think it's probably worth saying when you first sent me the pilot of this uh, podcast, uh, my response was, it's great, but it's a bit blokey. And Steve, your response was, not sure I can do a lot about that, but um, you have done a lot about that. You've had some amazing female guests and yeah, delighted to be here as the, the sub apothecary. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Now, not only were you sub one, but I, on the way home, I was cycling home. It was a beautiful day today. I hope it was nice where you were. And I decided to put on the oral apothecary playlist on Spotify. And if you haven't listened to it recently, it's very, very eclectic. And it reminded me, because literally no word of a lie, I put it on, it was second track, not first, but, and it's been raining today, and on came, I can see clearly now <laughs> the rain has gone. Stop that. <laughs> and that was Claire's choice, remember that? It absolutely was, yeah. Um, yeah, my, my sister berated me for not choosing the Hot House Flowers version, but yes, that was my choice. Yeah, I love the Hot House Flowers. Anyway, we should probably attend to... Well, Jamie and I, anyway, should attend to the fact that I have broken the Oral Apothecary podcast. So, before you go, we came back from Spain, didn't we, Steve, on we last Monday? And I came back to a recorded delivery letter. I opened <laughs> the letter, I turned to my wife and I said, STC has broken the podcast. And my wife's reply was, I'm surprised it's taken him this long. <laughs> Can I just say that the letter, not only was it from the BBC in London, but it said Messrs, Williams and Hayes. And it was basically a, what's the word again, James? Cease and desist. Because me and my big mouth decided that, oh, wouldn't it be fun one Sunday afternoon to see if we could get a trademark on Desert Island Drugs? So went through the process, did, did have a think about it, did speak to a couple of people. And there is another trademark called desert island dishes which is actually a podcast and it was obviously allowed it came after desert island drug uh, desert island disc sorry so i thought well they haven't objected to that you know what's what's to lose well quite a lot it seems <laughs> so yes jamie and i have a zoom meeting next week with the senior lawyer at the bbc to discuss so we've come up with it well we, we're quite interested in in people's views i suppose and we don't want to end up with boaty mcboatface as the name for the alternative to desert island drugs but we have come up with a few and uh, we'll have to see what happens we've got uh, all sorts of things we've got medication meditations medicines memories medicines memoir memory monograph clutching at <laughs> straws now. i know but they're, they're not as good as that are they or moiety memoirs or affinity drugs i quite like but anyway we'll have to see so look the first sign of trouble and gimmo's a no show though <laughs> yeah <laughs> he's worried that his house might be taken back so no don't worry don't worry listener we obviously will back down and we don't want to upset the bbc and you know it's a good use of public money to take us to court no it's not but we yeah it'll come back and it won't change what we're about and it's those three things that we ask the guests so yeah. Claire, what have you been up to? I've had an absolutely crazy week this week. Monday, 
uh, two mad things happened. We had uh, what was called a VIP visit at Wessex Academic Health Science Network. So that was the great and the good from NHS England. Uh, and we showcased all the work that we do in the HSN. So we had the lovely Bruce Warner come down and also Matt Whitty, who's the chief exec of the Accelerated Access Collaborative, who's also a pharmacist um, and other people such as Toby Young and, and others. And it, and it was a really great day, actually. And on the same day, I was launching the uh, NHS BSA opioid prescribing comparators. So I, I definitely earned my money on Monday and the rest of the week's been along the same lines, polypharmacy action learning sets, launched the polypharmacy uh, program at the HSN. So I was just sitting down thinking I would have a relaxing Thursday evening uh, when your phone call came. So uh, yeah, topping off nicely at the end of a busy week. You couldn't have been happier, could you? Delighted. And when I said to Jamie, when we should introduce you, should we say it's Claire from that market town that you'd think doesn't have a heroin problem? <laughs> we decided against it. But anyway, it's <laughs> a pleasure to have you on. I think I've said enough for tonight. So, James, have you got anything to add before we get tonight's guest? I have got one thing which I'd like to do, and it's just I've wanted to do this story for a while, and it's, uh, it applies to probably the majority of our listeners. There's been a lot in the news this week about how to ask for a pay rise or whether or not to ask for a pay rise, actually. Uh, the Bank of England have suggested that people don't ask for a pay rise. And I just want to share something with you that I did many years ago in Conway Local Health Group in North Wales. Went for a walk one lunchtime, walked into a second-hand bookshop, and I bought Routledge's Complete Letter Writer for Ladies and Gentlemen. £2 I paid for it. On page 107 of that book, there's this letter Letter from a clerk to his employer asking for a rise in wages. I bought the book for £2, I went back to my desk and I typed this email into the then capo. Do you remember capos? Chief Administrative Pharmaceutical Officers? Yes, yes. That was my boss at the time. And I typed this email into him and I'll tell you what happens. Sir, I have now been in your service for a period of 15 months (laughs) and I believe that during that time I have given you satisfaction. When I entered your employment, it was on the understanding that my salary should gradually increase till it reached a maximum of £200. I am now getting £150. And this is the sentence that I loved. I therefore take the liberty of asking for a rise in my salary, and I trust that you will consider my proposal favourably. Yours obediently, Arthur P. Rainsford. I paid £2 for that book. I went back to my office in Corwin Bay. I typed that email into my line manager, my boss, who was based remotely 50 miles away. And I asked for regrading from an uh, an E in old money to an F. An hour and a half later, he replied to say, Dear Jamie, thank you very much for your email. Um, Unfortunately, um, I'm not able to grant your regrading. However, I am able to give you three incremental points on the, which was then the pay scale, remember it, Whitley pay scale. That letter turned my £2 into just shy of 2 k in no time at all. And so when I saw them on the news this week saying, don't ask for a pay rise, well, that letter has stood me in good stead, and I remember it fondly. Mm. That is the sort of thing you would do, though, buying that book, by the way. Did it explain the term Messrs? Because that's the first time I've ever seen, had a letter directed to me that said Messrs, Williams and Hayes. Did it Let come me tell you, this book? this book has it all in it. How to ask for a maiden's hand in marriage goes everywhere. OK, it's my great pleasure. <laughs> and look, she's been very patient while we did all that to welcome Professor Delith James to the Oral Apothecary. Delith is a professor of health psychology and pharmacy practice. A clinical pharmacist by background, she completed a PhD exploring the role of illness perceptions and treatment beliefs in adherence to medication in myocardial infarction, supervised by two legends, Professors Rob Horn and John Weinman. One of her special interests is how, as healthcare professionals, we incorporate patients' perceptions into their consultations, in particular to support medicine's adherence. Delith is now based in the Department of Applied Psychology at Cardiff Metropolitan University. Her main interests include the application of psychological theories to understand medication-related behaviours. Delith is a member of the British Psychological Society and Division of Health Psychology. And just like myself, Claire and Gimmo, Delith is a Fellow of the Royal Pharmaceutical Society. Welcome, Delith. Thank you very, very much. It is an absolute honour and privilege to be here tonight having a little chat with the three apothecaries. Is there a, is there a female apothecary equivalent or is it the same apothecary? Yes. Uh, don't know. That's the kind of question you'd expect from a professor, isn't it? That's like a Professor Rachel Elliott question, that is. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not supposed to be asking the questions. No, no, it's fine. Go ahead. Viva away. <laughs> <laughs> so you've been very patient there because that's not a typical um, intro because there's a few things going on, Delith. What's on your agenda at the moment? What would you like to share with your oral apothecary? Well, uh, so yeah, it's been a busy time uh, in academia with the REF results coming out last week, the Research Excellence Framework 
uh, review, which is every seven years that universities go through to uh, establish the quality of their research and the funding that follows. So that was a busy week last week and also the Royal Pharmaceutical Society Fellows Dinner uh, on last Thursday where Claire and Jamie were there uh, in, in London. So that was very nice at the Law Thank Society. You, and Gimmo, yeah. Um, he does get a mention, yes, even though he's not here. <laughs> and then hot footed it back to the Principality Stadium on Friday for a, a doctoral researcher supervisor symposium. And then this week uh, has been another busy one. Uh, this morning saw the launch of the Behavioural Sciences Unit in Wales, which I believe, Jamie, were you at? Uh, as well. So a new, very exciting initiative in Wales and right up my street. Um, and I suppose the other thing to say is that, as uh, Jamie knows this, what's on my plate or what I'd like to have on my plate is a nice cheese board. But since having my stent inserted before Christmas and having a few health issues related to a cardiac event, um, yeah, I've been taking a, a fair few medicines recently myself. So that's always quite different, isn't it, to see it from the patient perspective for yourself, having researched it all these years and, oh, the irony <laughs> in so many ways. Yeah, so the irony, you know, we had Jamie Brewster on as a healthcare architect. He spent way too long in healthcare institutions. Even our clinical negligence lawyer seemed to be spending a bit of time in healthcare as well. And, and so, Delith, your area of your PhD research was on, just remind us of that from the intro. Yeah, so essentially it was looking at how um, patients interpreted the symptoms of a myocardial infarction and how that influenced the delay to seek help. Uh, and back in the day, it was to get your streptokinase, you know, call 999 uh, and door to needle time. Now, of course, it's very different and it's door to, you know, angioplasty time. And then following on from that was looking at how the patient's perceptions of the illness and treatment influenced their adherence to medication for a year following the myocardial infarction. Whoa, so, that... yeah, lots of things that I can apply to my experience before Christmas. Remind me, was it running for a train at Paddington? Yes. Yeah, so from my, from my first symptom on a Saturday in November in London, we'd come off the train running up Paddington Station at the back to get a taxi to take my daughter to her ballet class. Uh, that's when I first felt this pain, central chest pain, which I knew, well, I knew I wasn't fit, but I knew it wasn't to do with, you know, shortness of breath or being unfit. It wasn't indigestion. I, I knew that what it wasn't. And I thought, mm, I... I, uh, I need to take stock of this. So it eased off, luckily. And then um, within four weeks of that first symptom, I was having a stent inserted. Wow. So symptoms gradually got worse. Well, I, I went to the GP the following week and had a, you know, ECG and um, troponin levels done. And I was given a GTN spray because I think I, I knew at the time on that Saturday in London, if I'd had a GTN spray, in, you know, in my handbag, I would have reached for it, uh, having never needed one or used one before. So um, and the GTN did indeed ease the, some mild symptoms that I had subsequently. But as the weeks went forward, um, I think it was the day I'd used the GTN spray three times one morning. I thought, hey, I need to go to A&E and get this checked out, which I, of course, did. And 12 hours later, because this is December 2021, in the height of a, another COVID pandemic outbreak, uh, 12 hours later, waiting in A&E to be seen by a cardiologist um, and had an echocardiogram. Oh. Yeah, go for it. Sorry to interrupt. I was just going to say, you don't hear me say this often, but thank the Lord for cardiologists. That's what they do best. Indeed. So on this occasion, because of my history with, you know, low in terms of no risk factors, no diabetes, no family history of early um, premature MI or um, you know, smoking or alcohol, um, etc. He said that I, he, I could be admitted for an angiography gram but it would be after the weekend and it probably be you know show uh, atherosclerosis consistent with a 55 year old female and so at that you know there was nothing of note to see on the echo the mitropin levels were normal and um, the ecg was a bit you know sort of difficult to interpret having not had a baseline ecg i was sent home and told to carry on and not to wrap myself up in cotton wool so off to london again the next day or was it bath i think the next day but very quickly realized that i had to come home um, and rest and so then my gp tried to get in touch with the same cardiologist on the monday but um 
unfortunately couldn't get told because um, we realised then we ne- I needed an angio. Proceeded to be given a outpatient card chest pain clinic online in a couple of weeks, which of course wasn't ideal. Uh, so, in, so ultimately made an appointment to go privately towards the end of the week. And if I hadn't had that, I probably would have gone back to a and sooner. But the experience the previous week, you know, was was not good um, for lots of reasons, you know. So uh, seeing the consultant, the private consultant cardiologist, he saw straight away. By this time, I was getting, you know, very frequent symptoms using GTN spray a heck of a lot. And I knew it was not right. Um, So he did an ECG and history and basically contacted his mate in the angioplasty suite and said, I'm sending someone straight over to you. Wow. So that's quite some story. And thank you for being very open and honest. I mean, some technological stuff in there that maybe some listeners don't understand, but it just shows you some, some of the level of, you know, what was involved. But as Jamie said, a huge amount of irony here in relation to what you actually did your previous research in. So I suppose the killer question, and sorry if I'm sort of jumping the gun here now, but so what have you learned about, you know, adherence to medicines following such a, you know, life-changing event, I suppose? Yeah, so I think the adherence aspect came later after having the stent inserted. I think of that that initial seeking help, you know, that the story sure. you've just heard is related to responding to symptoms and how you interpret symptoms and what you do in response and how, of course, it used to be in the day, call 999 and you know, for an ambulance, do not make your own way to hospital. But of course, during COVID, that was flipped on its head and I live very close to the Heath Hospital. So so that was very different to what we used to you know, advise as a appropriate behaviour uh, following s- symptom interpretation back in the day. And so in terms of the adherence to medicines, yeah, that came later when I was on CCU. So just to maybe reel back a bit, when I got to the angio suite and they said, oh, you're, fi- you're fully clothed. <laughs> uh, well, yes, because I've just come from the street, essentially. Um, and I'd had a loading dose of clopidogrel, you know, 600 milligrams in A&E with a lot of water. So having the angiogram and where they identified a suboptimal occlusion of my descent, left descending coronary artery. Ooh, too much um, detail now. Which is one of the main arteries. <laughs> too much detail, lots of jargon. And I was able to, so there's a little hole here in my, in my hand where you can see that the, the angiogram, it's amazing, isn't it? Doesn't work, obviously, on a podcast, but um, <laughs> I, I could see everything on the screen in front of me. And, Come on, I um, want to know about the they, medicines. I know, I know. Well, interestingly, they were asking me, how are you doing? And of course, I felt quite flushed at one point. And they said, and I knew they'd just given me a, a nitrate infusion. So I said, I'm, I'm flushed, but it's the nitrate infusion you've just given me. And they said, oh, it's nice having a pharmacist on the table. You can really tell us how we're doing, what, what you're thinking. Um, anyway, and then when I did go to CCU um, and knew that coronary I'd be care on unit. this you know, coronary care unit, sorry, yeah, uh, and I knew I'd be on uh, you know a lifetime um, regimen of um, regime, I've been listening to of aspirin. It's uh, true though, isn't it? Yeah, very true. I learned something from that podcast. Aspirin, uh, r- ramipril, um, clopidogrel for the first year. Um, so essentially, those are two antiplatelet drugs, and uh, uh, ramipril is not it's called an ACE inhibitor that reduces um, blood pressure, and then atorvastatin, the famous statins at night. So when I knew that I was going to be prescribed these long term, my health psychology head kicked into action, really. And so I knew myself very well, because I had been taking vitamin D and um omega-3 for a a little time as you know people over 50 females over 50 might well do so I knew I needed to fit another four medicines into that regime and that that would not regimen and that that would not be easy so I went so I did a quick combi analysis on myself so I don't know if anyone's heard of combi which is a a psychological model go on remind the listener we have talked about it I think and I just say at this point what I remember about this is it's based on the American law of justice is that right this idea of you need um um, motivation, opportunity, and the third one, I can't remember. Um, capability. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's, so it's no different to any murder. You need capability, op- an opportunity, and a, and a motive. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that's where it uh, originated from. So so it's nothing to do with a combi boiler. The C-O-M, as you say, uh, of those three things. So I, 
And the combi, so those three things influence uh, any behavior. It can be applied to absolutely any setting. And so I did a combi diagnosis on myself, knowing very well that my motivation for taking these medicines would, was absolutely big tick. I knew exactly what the evidence was. I understood why, you know, there was a good match between my perception of what I'd just gone through and why I needed to take these. The opportunity to take them, you know, is there because, uh, you know, we're very lucky. We're in Wales. We have free um, health care and had access to medicines um, and it was the capability that I had some experience of, particularly around sort of there's two types. There's the physical skills of being able to take medicines and the psychological capacity. I knew that actually from the psychological capacity, um, incorporating a twice a day um, medication regimen is is tough. Morning ones are fine, but evening ones are tough. And I also knew from my experience that going away and having a change of um, routine on a weekend, the two key triggers to non-adherence. So I then, you know, went straight into how do I address these issues? And again, for those watching in black and white, I have some props <laughs> here with me. I went on oh. to, from, from the coronary care unit, went on to Amazon, ordered myself a nice little box that has morning and afternoon pill box yeah. Yeah, for the week, which I fill up on a, on a Sunday once a week, and that's great. Uh, however, I knew that the evening dose is what people quite often str struggle with. So I then downloaded the MediSafe app. So to have that as a reminder. And I also knew that, uh, as I say, going away is another, you know, and I, I go away on weekends quite often with my daughter's ballet, etc. So I bought another little prop here from Amazon from CCU, which is the little box that you can actually take out the individual days. So if you're away on a Sunday, you've got the morning and afternoon. If I hadn't done that, I know exactly how many medicines I have missed. And I have missed seven of my atorvastatins at night. And I took completely get... What, that. over seven days? Um, over a period of maybe three months, I missed seven days. And I know that from the box. But it means that when I have been away, I have not missed them. But I think if I hadn't known all that, and if I hadn't done that assessment on myself, it would have been a very different story. So lots of reflections there and, so, and a great question, Steve. Thank you for sharing that, Delith. You're not your average patient, I suppose, is what is what we're gonna say, is it? I mean, there isn't a, you know, average, average, but you know what I'm saying? You're a highly intelligent person with a, an interest in the psychology of adherence around myocardial infarction. So just shows you, doesn't it? Just how difficult it is. I mean, Claire, we, you know, you you talk a lot about this when we teach together. But what what do you think about this? Well, when we just had a, a brilliant example, and, and Dilith, you know, thank you for sharing that story. It, it, it's really really important to think through some of those things. We had exactly that example, but almost the flip side of that. So that so the M is the motivation. So this week on the polypharmacy action learning sets, we did GP. We were talking about polypharmacy and how you stop medicines, but actually the GP said she had a transplant patient who just would not engage. With with the medicines and I remember when I first saw the literature around transplant patients who don't engage with the medicines and, and being flabbergasted that you're on that transplant list and you wait so long and your life's hanging in the balance literally and then for me the thing you have to do after all of that trauma is take a tablet that's the easy bit but actually it's not and, and something that we take for granted that might be our motivation around healthcare you know these sort of patient activation measures actually we can make no assumptions and, and many many patients do not have that level of engagement and we had a, a brilliant example of that that we discussed uh, this week with the GPs we were training. Having said that though I have also had an experience where I haven't had the motivation so when I was in my early 40s I was diagnosed with glaucoma which is very early to be. Uh, my mum had glaucoma, so it's in the family, um, and it's it's a normal tensive. That means I've got normal pressures in my in my eye. Glaucoma, so it's a particular type of glaucoma due to myopia, which is short sightedness. Um, and for that, I struggled for a couple of years really to get my head around the fact that or to accept that I had that diagnosis. Um, and even when I asked to see the consultant, to I, I needed to be convinced that I had it to be able to take it. There were a few practical barriers. I, I wore contact lenses, so actually to take a use an eye drop meant that I had to get up half an hour earlier to put my, to put the drop in and then to put the lenses in. So there are lots of really practical things. And so if I wasn't motivated to do that. Um, and there was just no, uh, it did not make sense to me. And I think that was a really good example of where for that, or, or, you know, at that point, it was the motivation that was lacking. And I'm a healthcare practitioner, and I understand all these things. But it was the way that that being communicated wasn't in a patient centred way to make me change my behaviour. 
Dallas, when we met a few months ago and you were telling me the story, we talk on the podcast about treatment burden quite a bit, but this is a great example, isn't it, to go from being relatively fit and healthy to have, you know, the cocktail of medicines that we know about. But it takes a lot of effort to be a patient, doesn't it? That's So getting up half an hour early to do things. But I just looked up the definition before we came on. The workload in being a patient, taking and managing multiple medications, organising healthcare appointments, monitoring health, performing self-care, modifying lifestyle. That takes a lot of effort. Yeah, and the burden on carers as well. I think many of us have got parents looking after one another and the burden on carers is absolutely enormous too. Um, Hugely underestimated in all the work uh, that we do and and we ought to kind of start there with the practical setup that somebody's under before we try and put the medicines in amongst that. I'm still cogitating on what you just said, Claire, about that person who was on the transplant list, had a transplant. And I worked in a transplant centre. I came across patients like this. And like you say, I suppose my question, Deleth, with your psychology background is, one, do we know if there is any assessment available to assess people before they go on a transplant list, for example? And secondly, and this sounds really draconian, and I don't want this to come across in the wrong way, but you know how, for example, there are certain operations that will not happen, so they won't do you know, liver transplant if you're still drinking, okay? There are certain operations they won't do if you continue to smoke or if you're over a certain BMI, they won't do the operation. So if you see where I'm going with this is that if somebody appears to not have the motivation to do it, is that enough reason to, you know, I I mean, this is too complicated for me to even think it through, but can you help me at all here? Yeah, uh, I don't know of anything specific in the sort of transplant area, but I certainly, there has been a lot of work looking at, you know, patients' beliefs about medicines and motivations in that area. And it is very complex, you know, um, that's patients with renal dialysis and the whole kind of complex medication regimen they have to take as well as the post transplant kind of regimen as well. So there is work going on to use things like the beliefs about medicines questionnaire of that Rob Horn, a professor of behavioral medicine at UCL, has designed and his company, the, the Spoonful of Sugar. Jamie and I met with him and John Wyman a few weeks ago, in fact, and discussed this very thing. So there are some diagnostic tools that can be adapted to different therapeutic areas. Areas. I suppose the thing for me would be then in terms of, you know, where do you put the blame or who's, you know, it actually have, have they had an opportunity to have a conversation to address some of those beliefs? And so you wouldn't necessarily use it as a screening tool for whether they have the procedure or not, but you'd certainly use it as a screening tool to see what pre-surgery interventions were needed to prepare them. Because I think the timing is really key, isn't it? So for me, it was an acute cardiac event, but I was able to process it quite quickly. But others, it might be, you know, for one, two, three months down the line that you you need the interventions or you're ready for the interventions. And so readiness for those type of medication burdens, I think, is something that we probably need to do more of. Complex. Is it right? Complex? Complicated? Complex. You might have over... I think your question was oversimplifying a complex area. Oh, it certainly was. I mean, I say I'm trying to be honest about that. I'm, I'm not suggesting for one minute that we should. I'm just saying... I'm trying to go through the examples of where we don't do something because because as you said the burden for the individual as well as the healthcare you know utilization and and all the complications that then occur and it's just like mm, I can't I can't get my head around it Claire but I think that's because we in healthcare we make the assumption here's your medicine take it one three times a day the default is patients will ad- adhere comply with that and we know from the evidence they don't so what we have to do, I think, in healthcare is, you know, 30 to 50 percent of medicines are not taken as intended. So let's start the consultation like that and say, OK, it's quite hard to take these. How am I going to work with you so that you can fit this bisphosphonate in an hour before breakfast? How, what do I need to do as the clinician to work with you so that we get to a point that works for you and for the medicine? And yet that's not how we do it. We go, there you go, take this one three times a day. Um, and, and so it's, it's not a bit of wonder we get the results that we do. And I think having a whole systems approach to how we uh, assess where the barriers or facilitators are is so important. And again, Jamie, on that um, launch event today, they were certainly advocating applying behavioural science to systems approaches. So working transdisciplinary was the, my new word of the day. Um, so, you know, by just looking at the pharmacy issues alone is not going to address all these issues. So, um, that that's something I think that we need to get a little bit better on from a, a pharmacy point of view. The Oral Apothecary is sponsored by Jamie Hayes Executive Coaching and OneLessPill.com. 
Okay, well, very interesting chat, and I'm sure we could talk on much longer, but we need to move along. So, Delith, one of the pleasures of coming on the Oral Apothecary, as I'm sure you're aware, is you have to give us, first of all, something that you might take. No, not take. <laughs> first of it all. It used to be a pleasure until Steve broke it. <laughs> yeah, it used to be a pleasure. So, call it what you like. You know what you have to do here. This is a medication or a drug that you have an affinity for that has a powerful emotion, if you like. So what would you like to give us for the oral apothecary formulary? Okay, so I was thinking aspirin at one point, but I know Gimmo's had that. And I know, I'm sure it's fine to have another one, but um, I'm actually going to go for something which does have, it's happened a long time ago when I was a resident pharmacist at Charing Cross Hospital in London, so 30 years ago, but it's still in the memory. And it's a dispensing error that I was involved with. And hopefully one that illustrates how a systems based approach or, you know, no blame culture hopefully will have changed since then. Uh, and the drug is slow K. Uh, slow K was dispensed to, which is potassium, was dispensed to two renal patients instead of slow sodium. Slow sodium being something that they use for uh, muscle cramps so after they've had hemodialysis and actually so uh, potassium being something that is a big no-no for people with renal problems. So the way I found out was um, sort of early in January, uh, early in the new year, being asked to come into the chief pharmacist's office to be pointed out that the patient had noticed that these orange tablets were wrong, they weren't white. Um, and immediately I knew that I'd dispensed two or checked two at the same time. So we were able to follow up and identify the second patient and get that sorted. But, you know, as, as it would have been back in the day, I, I mean, I felt awful and still do to this day. But we all have these experiences and these, you know, we are we are human after all. But I suppose if you start to unpick it now, it was that the slow sodium, the slow, slow potassium was next. They were next to each other on the shelf in the dispensary. Uh, they've changed packages now. So, you know, they don't look the same, but they used to look very similar. Um, it was a pharmacy technician who dispensed it and I was checking it and I love pharmacy technicians but I think if I'd gone to the shelf I would have made that real effort to you know it was a red flag that knowing those two are next to each other. Ooh, that's interesting <laughs> yeah. it's interesting you say that because you know I, what year did you think this this happened? 1990 I worked out I think. Okay so let me tell you this error was still happening in 2010 Okay, and you're right. So for the listener, these are what we call salads. So sound alike, look alike. So they both say slow. One says NA, remember your chemistry, and one says K. And like you say, the, the pots are identical. It is not surprising. It doesn't matter who you are, everybody could make this error. And it took ages, absolutely ages before they changed the, the packaging. It was an outrage, really. Um, so it was certainly happening 10, nearly 20 years after you were, were, were involved in it. it it's a great memory in relation to I guess maybe the first or the most significant one that you remember but what do you think you changed most about your practice after that if anything well I know I'd been on call it was it'd been it was New Year's Day that we'd actually that would have the event would have a critical incident would have happened so I would have been on call oh hang on a minute that changes everything yeah New Year's Eve I mean we <laughs> Gimmo would be having a field day if he was on here now. Did, he'd have St his five did wives. STC jump in before you'd finished, Danith? Sorry. Possibly. Go on, go on. I was just going to say the holes of the Swiss cheese are stacking up now already. We've got we've got at least two layers here. Carry on, Dill. So, you know, that's essentially it. And, of course, looking back with the Swiss cheese approach, you think, oh, my goodness, it, you know, it would, have been, it would have been really nice to have brought the team in to say, right, what should we do to make sure this doesn't happen again? And that just wasn't the way that we were thinking at the time, even though I'd identified all those things in my mind as being, you know, stressors or trigger points, I just wouldn't have felt enabled to do anything about it myself. And so, um, yeah, I think it's a great illustration, hopefully, of how things have moved on and that human factors, you know, it's a great example of human factors, isn't it? Yeah, so. well, with your psychology hat on, that's a great choice. So slow K, definitely going into the oral apothecary formulary. What about a career anthem then, Delith, for the Spotify oral apothecary playlist? Oh, this was easy. <laughs> it's oh. meatloaf, bat out of hell. <laughs> All right. Okay. Another rocker on the podcast then. So quite timely, obviously. Meatloaf passed away recently, but uh, this is even before 1990. It was when I was working in Boots Pharmacy in Llanelli as a 16, 17 year old. I would have bought, um, that was the first album I bought with my, my earnings. 
So, and of course, working in Boots meant that I would have used that in my UCAS application to get into Bath University to study pharmacy. Um, The only thing people don't know, of course, or they didn't know, is that I never worked in the pharmacy. I I worked on the record counter the whole time. Genius. Yeah. Well, you were the number seven consultant. That's, That's quite some album to start your collection off with. Yeah. It's the only song I know all the words to. Well, that's what I said to my daughter recently, and then I was proven wrong. <laughs> that's quite a long song, isn't it? So, um, yeah. That's a great story in relation to setting off your journey in pharmacy. So, Meatloaf, Bat Out of Hell. Okay, that definitely makes it in. And the third thing, then, is a book for the Oral Apothecary Library for the listener that you'd like to recommend. Okay. Well, I've got more props. I've got bought it with me. So, the book is... Flourish by Martin Seligman. But there's a bit of a backstory to how I came to this book. And I'll very quickly refer to Michael Marmot's The Health Gap. And that's not the book. I know I'm only allowed one. But I I go to the Hay Festival every year and had the pleasure of listening to Michael Marmot talk about uh, The Health Gap and had it signed. Um, We will show you by Michael afterwards. Here we go. He says, to Delich instead of Delith. (laughs) D-E-L-Y-C-H. Bless. But, um, you know, keeping this. And it was when you talked about being a a GP in Australia when he was, you know, young and dispensing the red pill for depression and the patient coming back and when it hadn't worked and giving him the blue pill instead and how that, you know, made him go into his area looking at, um, you know, the challenges around, you know, equal unequal healthcare systems and things like that and that got me thinking of, about that very sort of nature and then I managed to get hold of Flourish which is a book about uh, positive psychology and um, it's Martin Seligman who is professor of positive psychology at Pennsylvania University um, put forward a model called PERMA model which is essentially saying that uh, you're more resilient or you have more bounce back ability from depression if you can um, apply some of the positive psychology concepts, looking at your positive emotions, your engagement with daily life, your relationships, the meaning you have for life and your accomplishments in life, those five things. And as a result of reading this, I uh, was lucky enough to meet Martin Seligman at a conference, a British uh, Psychological Society conference in Brighton, shook his hand and said, I, I'm, I'm going to use your work, but I don't know how yet. So if I shake your hand, will it be more likely to work? And on the train back, thought, do you know what? I'm so privileged to be able to have access to this type of information and to maybe put it into practice. And there was a little bit of European funding around at the time for PhD. And I managed to persuade my the wonderful Alison Sparks, who runs the health dispensary in Neath, to uh, part fund a PhD to actually look at how we could implement a PERMA-based intervention in a community pharmacy setting. So that book really has uh, career-based implications. Sadly, COVID hit when we were about to uh, start the the intervention. So things got a bit tricky, but uh, that's another story. Anything to do with positivity is big with me. So positive psychology flourish by Martin Seligman. Excellent. Well, that does sound like a good read. So definitely one to add to the Oral Apothecary Library. So thank you very much, Delith, for three excellent, interesting choices. So it's me this week, and I'll try and keep this brief on the micro discussion. So this is a paper from a group from Sydney, actually. It was published in the BMJ, sorry, Quality and Safety in 2021. Andrea Torres Roble and Victoria Garcia Cardenas. I hope I've said that correct. And what we're in, why we're interested in this is this: this is a effectiveness of a medicines adherence management intervention in a community pharmacy setting, a cluster randomised control trial. This is really very timely, certainly in England, because there's a lot of talk about know your numbers and there's a big campaign around um, high blood pressure and identifying and then trying to ensure that people you know blood pressure is treated and I know there are similar things always going on in, in Wales and other countries as well but this was therefore about your healthcare expert on the high street so this was a six-month uh, cluster randomized control in Spain community pharmacists and patients had to suffer from either hypertension asthma COPD and then they had an intervention it was a multiple intervention but they essentially had to go to the pharmacist and they were 
they had things like motivational interviewing and they had things to try and encourage people to take their medication and they met them every month for six months and they compared it with a control group where they just received their medicines they got them dispensed and then they compared at the end whether or not the patients in the intervention group had better adherence to their medicines this was self-assessed and whether or not they had lower blood pressure which they did in the intervention group, and they had better self-assessed scores in relation to their asthma and their COPD. So, conclusions were that a community pharmacy-led medication adherence intervention could be effective at improving adherence and also clinical outcomes. And if you remember, Professor Rachel Elliott told us about some work that she had done, different to this, but about the success and the affordability of the new medicine service in England. So, who wants to kick us off? A great paper. I hadn't seen it, so thank you for sending it to me. I was having a chat with my PhD student about it today, actually. I run a journal club for my PhD students. We couldn't get everyone together, but Sarah, who's looking at a hypertension visualisation platform being um, delivered through a community pharmacy uh, as an intervention, was very interested in this. So, a great paper, good quality a uh, nice study. Some little things for me around, uh, and a great, and a great uh, theoretical basis using PAPA, the perceptions and practicalities approach, together with this readiness for change. I suppose the downside for me is that um, blood pressure did reduce, but only di- diastolic, not systolic. And so actually, if they're advocating rolling this out into community pharmacies widespread, I'm not sure if uh, maybe, you know, in terms of the cost effectiveness, I would have liked to have seen some follow up around cost effectiveness before advocating it because six visits sounds like quite a lot and quite resource intense, I'm sure. It would have been nice to know what type of interventions they the patients needed because some of the interventions maybe could have been done by, you know, quite easily with apps and stuff and, and others may have needed a bit more um, psychological behavioural input. And I suppose the, the last thing for me about teaching motivational interviewing in two days, um, I'd like to see anyone who <laughs> just manages to teach motivational interviewing in two days. So we didn't know the background of the pharmacist to know what level of tr- background training they'd had. But I was really impressed. To be, and who would have thought in Spain of all places? Well, yeah. But as you say, you know, you've got to have really sound methodology to get through the BMJ quality and safety to be published. What did you think, Claire? Um, yeah, a, a nice paper. Uh, I, I looked at it while I was eating my macaroni cheese. Um, so, <laughs> Thank you. Um, not not a huge surprise. Uh, I think, you know, we saw in the new medicine service, as you said, you know, 10% improvement in adherence. There are very few studies that are able to demonstrate, um, you know, improvement along along those lines. And it just made me reflect of when I was a community pharmacist, I used to set myself a little challenge with metformin patients. So people newly prescribed metformin. And I would set myself a little challenge because uh, I think if you spend time with people at the beginning explaining about the side effects how to get over them then when they came in for their next prescription for metformin I would take that as a win whereas I think when you just dispense that medicine and patients lo and behold have a little bit of a tricky time um, it's not surprising that they make a decision not to take them so not a big surprise very important for England to have a look at this around what we're doing with blood pressure um, like you said Steve around know your medicine so nice paper very topical I suppose the last thing for me is that it also chimes with our polypharmacy work How many times are people given a second, third, fourth antihypertensive medicine without anybody checking how well they're adhering to the first one that was prescribed? We just take their blood pressure, go, it's not working and add in another one. So it feels to me like this this kind of work is important to uh, to the polypharmacy agenda as well. Yeah, really good point, actually. Jane, what did you think? I'm going to pick up on the motivational interviewing component of it, really, because as Della said, to do it in, Della and I are lucky that we've had, uh, we've been able to work with some of the motivational interviewing gurus over the years. And so I had the pleasure of working with Professor Steve Rolnick and Professor Chris Butler on the STAR study. I would add motivational interviewing to our undergraduate curriculum now, really, if we're adding prescribing, and so we know our pharmacists are going to come up as prescribers, then if you see where they've put motivational interviewing, as, and it's a technique, we were talking about with Rob about this last last week, weren't we, uh, Della, that it's a technique the motivational interviewing is, then it's a technique that we should all have because they are the conversations. It's about having good conversations with patients. And I think it's a skill that you can't leave to chance because, you know, we see how how important it is. And and we mentioned motivational interviewing for the first time probably in three series with Tracy Brown when we were talking about uh, management of chronic pain. I think that's the first time that we mentioned it probably. And we should probably give it more of a spotlight in in future episodes because it is... It's so clever. It's tough. It's not easy. I've got my Bible here on on motivational interviewing. You can see that it's stickered up, but it is. It's so clever. I, I just think that's a great point, 
um, about the more the the more we broaden out prescribing rights to people, and rightly so, this should go hand in hand with it. You shouldn't be able to pick up a prescription pad and give somebody a prescription without really being able to do some of this uh, much better than we currently all do it. So yeah, totally agree with that, Jamie. Yeah, really good point. Yeah, you will know, Dallas, but for the listener. I think that when you look at it, and and James McCormack, the Canadian guru that we had on previously about evidence-based medicine, he's always at pains to point this out. So I'm going to point it out on his behalf. What you have to remember is that even if you were in the control group, the amount of people who were more adherent, so in other words, more likely to take their medication at the end of six months, went up from about 45% to about 65% in the control group, and it went up from 45 to 90 percent in the intervention group so you still get a benefit by in the control so it i think the paper says you're actually five they were five times more likely to be adherent to the medication if they were in the intervention group than the control group and that is that is significant i mean you know we all know about the statistical significance in there and and that's why it's a good paper that's why it made it and i think about the diastolic blood pressure delith as you said because i've done some work around this and it, it picks it up doesn't it in the paper and it says remember you know, so sorry to go back to cardiology, but look, they are the kings of clinical trials. If you want to show the benefit of something, you fill your study fill full of people who've got really bad. They're out. Their 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 baseline is really bad. And what they're saying here is, is that actually the baseline of people's blood pressure at the beginning was actually not that bad anyway. Whereas if you put people in who've already got really bad blood pressure, or you pick people in a, in a study because they're really high risk of having a heart attack, guess what? The chances are that you're going to be able to show a bigger, you know, a bigger gain, aren't you, through an intervention? So it is hard, isn't it, in studies to show, you know, remember, I mean, a five five millimeters of mercury reduction in diastolic blood pressure is about as good as what you'll get with a blood pressure medication on average and it, this was about three i think which blood pressure is that is that the one on the top or the bottom oh the diastolic's the one on the bottom sorry in the show notes we'll we'll put the links to the know your numbers you mentioned james mccormack so that brings me back to the motivational interviewing because james mccormack mentioned about people getting stuck and motivational interviewing in professor steve rolling's book there's a lot of talk about patients people clients when they become stuck and you know when they have at least two ways to think about something and they get stuck between those choices and then they go on to describe it that sometimes with our interactions with clients or patients they're more like a wrestle whereas what we should be looking is like a dance back and forth and so when motivational interviewing is going well with your patients your clients it should feel like that dance not that we're having a wrestle with our and and patients often use the word battle don't they they have a battle with healthcare professionals about something. I think that's where that non-judgmental approach is so key. So, you know, we are not looking to blame and who, you know, it's it's just as much our responsibility when someone doesn't take their medicines as it is the patient's responsibility because we haven't done our job well in that sense. Um, and being non-judgmental. And the, and the role of emotion, I think, in behaviour change is something that I think we as pharmacists may be uh, not that great at sort of dipping into so, you know, the, the emotional drivers for change are, are, are huge. You know, like, like the story I described, you know, the cardiac event I went through. There's nothing quite like that to change your behaviour. More work needed in, in those type of uh, interventions as well, I think. I just like the, the point you made, Jamie, about getting stuck. So I do, I'm doing quite a lot of work on opioid prescribing and trying to address the kind of opioid prescribing crisis that we have uh, currently. And I work with pharmacists who do a lot in this space, uh, as well as pain consultants. And they talk a lot about patients being stuck and our role as their supporters, trying to kind of unstick, unblock, find out what motivates them, what are the hooks that we can sort of get going to then start to say, well, actually, the answer to some of this is to taper your dose and eventually help you to live life um, well with your pain rather than being on opioids and, and feeling as poorly as you do. So I think that getting stuck could, could apply to a huge range of conditions and people. And it's just a nice way to describe it, isn't it? It's something that everybody can understand. We're, we've all been there, yeah. A big thank you to Dereth for joining us on the Oral Apothecary and for sharing her stories, her drug of choice, her career anthem and her book for the Oral Apothecary Library. A big thank you to Claire for stepping in at the last minute. Coming up next time, we'll be joined by Dr Nikki Umaru. Nikki is a principal principal lecturer in clinical pharmacy. Her research interests include patient and medication safety and medicines optimization in vulnerable patient groups.
groups across the healthcare interface. We look forward to catching up with Nikki next time on the Oral Apothecary. You can contact us via Twitter at Oral Apothecary. We're on LinkedIn. You can email us at oralapothecarypod at gmail.com. Over to Gimmo now for the final ingredient. Hello. Um, thank you, Delith, for that. And thank you, Claire, for stepping in at the last moment. It was really appreciated. It meant I could go and watch my son play football, which was fantastic. But here I am for the final ingredient. And alternative to drugs are a theme with this podcast. We often talk about them. And an article in The Guardian last week where they interviewed Tim Spector, a professor of genetic epidemiology at King's College London, and incidentally, the author of the Zoe COVID app that many of you will have heard of, gives another interesting example. According to Tim, he attributes healthy eating to moving on from being a pill-popping, depressed stroke victim with high blood pressure. It was the discovery that the composition of microbes in people's guts could influence body weight that led him to his research. He says that the state of your gut microbes will influence your blood sugar peaks as well as how you digest fats. This is important as these are factors that can lead to inflammation. Chronic inflammation can increase the risk of various diseases including type 2 diabetes, heart disease and some cancers. A microbiome can also shape our response to infection. Spectre is known for his work on the Zoe COVID app where people log their daily symptoms and he believes that this data shows that those on a plant-based diet prior to COVID were less susceptible to catching COVID. I'm not saying that claim is proven by the way but that's what he's saying. So how can we use this information? It is plants rich in polyphenols that help, generally ones with strong tastes and colours, slight bitterness, thick skins, etc. Other foods include green tea, dark chocolate, and those foods already fermenting with bacteria like sauerkraut. So there you have it. Jamie has chatted on here before about his love for asparagus. Maybe he's onto something. This was a Three Apothecaries production. Sound engineer, Jimbo Slough. Original music, Jamie Brewster. Artwork by David Baker. Thanks for listening to the Oral Apothecary Podcast. Warning, may colour urine. This episode of the Oral Apothecary is sponsored by OneLessPill.com, a medicines optimization consultancy. (laughs) 